people. It's just a real blessing. And so um, it's just uh, it's glorious worship, right? And so we want to continue that tonight. And tonight we're looking at the parable of the lost son from Luke 15. Parable of the lost son. So if you will, turn with me to Luke 15. We'll read this together and then pray together. The parable of the lost son from Luke 15. That parable begins in verse 11. So Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Here Christ says, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And so he divided to them his livelihood. Not many days after, after the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. And now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in, and therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. And so he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I have been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Let's pray together. Uh, Father in heaven, Lord, we praise you, worship you. God is so in awe of you and your amazing grace in saving sinners. Uh, you're so gracious and so good, and God, we are so undeserving. Lord, that you would save, you would provide a sacrifice, provide a ransom. It is amazing grace. And so thank you, Lord, that you're so gracious and so good. God, you don't merely make us as hired servants, Lord, but you adopt us into your family, into your kingdom, and make us as sons. We praise and worship you, Lord, for that. Thank you for the salvation that you've given us in Christ. And I pray that um, this study tonight of this parable would, Lord, embolden and flame our hearts with great joy, Lord, over your forgiveness, your pardon, this glorious plan of redemption, uh, and your great grace, your great mercy. And may we take joy, Lord, in that. And I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here, God, that isn't saved, they would take great warning from this, and that they would see your graciousness and your mercy, and they would see the utter futility of living in their sin in the far country, that they might turn to you and live. And thank you for this time together, Lord, and thank you for your spirit, thank you for your word. Be with us now as we study together in Jesus' name, amen. All right. This is, again, the parable of the lost son from Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. And here in Luke 15, this is a, a trilogy of parables that all basically have the same point that they're making. As we looked at the parable of the lost sheep in verses 1 through 7, we have the parable of the lost coin in verses 8 through 10, 
And then now the parable of the lost son in verse, verses 11 through 32. And really a trilogy of parables that have basically the same point. We saw God the son represented in the parable of the lost sheep in verses 1 through 7. And how God the son pursued the sheep, rescued the sheep, and brought the sheep back into the sheepfold. Uh, but we saw here, we see in the parable of the lost coin beginning in verse 8, the Holy Spirit represented really a similar point here. And then in verses 11 through 32, we're going to see tonight the father. In this chapter, we see the delight, the joy, the rejoicing of God over one sinner who repents. We see the delight, the joy of the Trinity, the three-in-one Godhead uh, in saving sinners. And his will of desire, his heart in desiring to save sinners, God's heart, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rejoices to save people, rejoices to see them saved, to repent of their sin, to put their faith in Christ, and to spare them from wrath, spare them from judgment. And oftentimes when someone comes to grips with biblical theology, well, for whatever reason, that's difficult for people to grasp. Where you are in your sin, the Lord God desires to save you, desires to see you come to repentance. The Lord wants to save you. Sometimes when people think they in grappling in their mind with the tension between God's sovereignty and salvation and man's responsibility, sometimes they believe themselves to be reprobate or believe themselves to be outside of the saving work of God and redemption, outside of Christ's grace and mercy on the cross, uh, simply is not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible desires to save, rejoices over saving, delights in saving, wants to see sinners saved. And so much so that in the first two parables here, in verses 1 through 7, the parable of the lost sheep, and in the parable of the lost coin, it's God that is seen going after the lost sheep, the lost coin. In those parables, you see God as the initiator. He pursues, runs after, drags back to himself lost sinners, lost sheep, lost coin. In sovereign grace, God is the initiator. Uh, we love him. Why? because he first loved us. That's right. God is the initiator. He first loved us. Romans 3 says no one seeks after God, right? No one seeks after him. God goes and pursues the sinner. In John chapter 6, Christ says that no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. It's the Lord who is the initiator, the Lord who is the pursuer of lost sinners. Uh, and these parables, the first two parables here, reflect an accurate and biblical theology of that. God goes and pursues the lost. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. But now here, beginning in verse 11, we have the next parable in the trilogy. This parable, often titled the parable of the lost son or the, the prodigal son, prodigal meaning wasteful, prodigal meaning reckless, uh, debauched, selfish, any number of adjectives, uh, could easily here be titled, instead of the parable of the lost son or the parable of the prodigal son, it could easily be titled the parable of the delight of the father. You know, the parable of the joy of the Father, um, the parable of the erupting joy of God the Father in saving sinners and making them a son of the kingdom, uh, the parable of the perfect joy of the forgiving Father in providing grace and pardon to an undeserving son and his great delight in blessing him as a son. It's a Puritan title, all right? And the requisite judgment of that old self-righteous son who was representative of the Pharisees, right? It's like, <laughs> put up here, it's entitled this parable. Um, there is great joy seen in God saving a sinner. And here you see the Lord God, represented by the man, beginning in verse 11, who is waiting on the porch. It was God in the parable of the lost sheep and God in the parable of the lost coin that pursued the sinner but here, in a slight difference here, a subtle difference, the prodigal of the lost son, you see the father here, this man representing God the Father, uh, sitting on the porch, in a sense, waiting on the return of his wasteful prodigal son, uh, looking afar off, if you will, into the distance, waiting for his son to return. When he sees him coming, he runs out to meet him, right? His son has returned his son has come back from the far country, come back from his wasteful living, his prodigal life. And then we see the, the gracious and forgiving ways of the father in lavishing all the blessings of sonship on his returned son um, in response. Now, this parable also 
reflects a biblical and accurate theology. Ezekiel 33 says, Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die? Jeremiah 29, verse 13, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, people perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. This is also accurate biblical theology. This is man's responsibility. We see in the first two parables an indication of God's sovereignty in pursuing the lost sinner. And here, in this parable of the lost son, we see the biblical theology, the right theology, the right understanding of man's responsibility, the son coming to his senses and turning and seeking after the Father and coming back from the far country. When we come to our senses, we're to turn from our sin. Anyone in their right mind, anyone in their right mind leaves their sin, forsakes their sin, and turns to Christ. We are to step out in faith in the Father, and that's the Father's design, the Father's plan. This is the Father's way. Um, that he will, we have faith that he will save, that he will pardon, he will forgive, he will cleanse, and he'll rejoice in doing it. And he wants to do it. And this is the Father. This is God the Father in Scripture. He delights in forgiving. He delights in saving. Do you believe, in thinking through this yourself, do you believe that God desires and wants to save you? Whatever strange reason, that's not always an easy question for people to answer. I've asked people that question before. Do you believe that right now that the Lord God, right this minute, in His grace and in His mercy, would save you? And for some people, it's just difficult to even utter the words, yes, I'll submit to you that that's the basis and foundation of what genuine saving faith looks like. If I go to my Father, He will pardon. He'll forgive. It's the grace and mercy of God. Listening through this parable, listen, you need to understand that God will save you now. He will save you tonight. He'll save you by His Spirit, through His Word, tonight. It's just a matter of believing, turning from your sin, turning from the far country, and putting that faith and reliance and trust in Christ alone. Where is your faith? Have faith in God's saving ways. If you are outside the kingdom... God will receive you. He'll run down off the front porch and meet you in the way and fall on you and embrace you and kiss your neck and lavish good gifts on you, lavish gifts for a son on you. He'll bless you as a son. He'll rejoice over you. The Word of God says that He'll by no means cast you out. doesn't matter how far away the country that you've been living in is, it doesn't matter what you've done while you're there. Lord God, He says, He promises, He'll by no means cast you out. If you'll just come to your senses and turn from that, you can't stay in the far country, you've got to return. He won't save you there. You've got to get out of Dodge. And get out of that city before it's destroyed, right? God is so gracious, so good, uh, so forgiving. But here, in stark contrast to God the Father, beginning in verse 11, we see in the sons here a profile or an anatomy of rebellion. We see the anatomy of rebellion. Here in point one, beginning in verse 11, we see a profile of the rebel. We're going to see rebellion displayed in this, this first section of this parable. And beginning in point one, we see the profile of the rebel. Our story opens in verse 11 with these words. A certain man had two sons. Now, as we've said, the man here in our parable represents God the Father, represents God the Father. Of these two sons that this man had, he had an older son and a younger son. The older son, as we'll see, represents one kind of rebel, right? And we've looked at that one kind of rebel uh, when we looked at the parable last week. Those were those, this one kind of rebel, were those that looked over, their, over the wall at the sinners, the crowd that was gathering around Christ. And they sat there and rolled their eyes, smacked their lips, shook their head, disgusted that Christ would eat with sinners and tax collectors. They were self-righteous. They were religious and lost. They were self-righteous religious insiders, and they were whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. They were hypocrites. 
That's the older son in our parable here. The younger son represents our first type of rebel, the type of rebel we'll look at tonight. This type of rebel is represented in the last parable by the crowd that was gathering around Christ, those who were sinners. But they had come to their, sen their senses, realized that they were sinners. They knew who they were, all right? He is here, the sinner. He's the tax collector. He's the outcast from the kingdom. And he's an outcast because of his sin. His sin is shameful, and he knows it. But astounding, astoundingly, astonishingly, amazingly, as astounding and as, as astonishing as his sin and rebellion was, the father is gracious toward him, all right? This is our first type of rebel, astounding, astonishing, amazing rebellion. And let's look at his profile, looking at verse 12. Here, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And so he divided to them his livelihood. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. All right? Let's look now at the marks of these rebellions. The first thing that he says, the younger of them, the younger of his son, said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. Now, this was a brazen, rebellious, unloving, ungrateful, hateful demand. And we need to put ourselves in the perspective of the son saying this in the first century in context. Everyone listening, anyone listening to his son talk to his father this way would have understood this to mean, Dad, I wish you were dead already. I wish you were dead. Let me have what's coming to me. I want away from here, and I want away from you. This is what the son would have been saying to the father. I want you dead, and I want out. Give me what is mine. This was a pronouncement that the son had absolutely no love, no concern for the dad whatsoever, was completely unloving, ungrateful, and wanted out, wanted to be on his own. Uh, and it's true, isn't it, that no one can hurt you quite like the ones that you are most close to, right? Imagine a son or a daughter. Maybe you've had a teenage son, a teenage daughter that has responded to you in this way. It is hurtful. It hurts to have the ones that you love, the ones that you are most close to, react this way. This son wanted his dad dead. In addition, it wasn't here, give me the estate. We need to see the difference here. This was give me the portion of goods that falls to me. Now, ordinarily, the firstborn son would have gotten two-thirds of the estate as being the firstborn. This younger son would have gotten a third of the estate for him. Now, what would have been done is that at the time of the father's death, the older son, the younger son, would have managed the estate that fell to them for the purpose of future generations, for their family. And they would have reaped the benefit of that. They would have managed that estate. That estate would have stayed in the family and would have been used to provide for future generations. It's not the word that's used here. It's not what he's asking. When he says, give me the portion of goods that falls to me, he's saying, listen, I don't care about the estate. I don't care about my future. I don't care about my future family. I don't want the responsibility of managing anything. Just give me what you owe me so I can cash it in and live for myself. That's what he's asking for here. He was completely despising, in a sense, of his birthright, despising his future, no concern whatsoever. He just wanted to sell out, sell out and get out, sell out and use everything he could uh, that he could get for it, completely for his own selfish desires, his own selfish indulgence. He was totally and completely, totally out for number one, and no one else. He could care less. And this was an extreme, so you understand, an extreme form of disrespect, an extreme form of disrespect. He hammered the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, had absolutely no regard for that commandment whatsoever. This was highly dishonorable to his father, highly dishonorable to his family, to future generations. This was highly dishonorable to the generations that had held that property, held that estate for his benefit in generations past. It was just disgraceful. It was shameful for him to have just given it up or wanted to give it up just to live for himself. This was an extreme demonstration of being completely self-absorbed, just selfish, self-indulgent, self-absorbed, could care less about anyone else. And it's really, if you think about it, it's described uh, by Romans chapter 1, verse 30, backbiters, haters of God, violent, 
proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, right? Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving. You could tack in there ungrateful, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death. He would have certainly have known this. He would have known how disgraceful, how shameful, how self-indulgent this was. Uh, Certainly, uh, children (laughs) from a young age were probably taught the Old Testament Levitical law. They would have understood that a disobedient, rebellious, unsubmissive son could have been put to death for behaving that way. In Deuteronomy 21, verse 18, listen to what this says. This is the law. He would have known this. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son... I know what it would have questioned. No one hearing this would have questioned that this was a rebellious son. If he has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city, to the gate of his city, and they shall say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And then all the men of this city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you and all Israel shall hear and fear. That's a fearful thing. For any kid at this day and age, at this point in time, uh, you don't want to dishonor your father and your mother. You want to live long in the land. You don't want to be stoned to death with stones, right? But certainly at this point in time, in the first century, it wouldn't have been uncommon for the father who was, by this act of the son, was shamed and disgraced for him to then turn and disown or disinherit his son. They might have put a son like this out and would have recognized him as dead, In other words, don't recognize him anymore. It would have been dead to them. He might have shamed or set up circumstances to shame the son uh, for discipline, basically, for shaming the father. Um, If this was my mom, she would have taken her shoe off, (laughs) right? She would have maybe go out in the backyard and pull a switch off the tree. Uh, This was serious. Uh, But the father here didn't do that. Remember, as we go through this, the man pictures God the father. The father here didn't do that. Look what it says in verse 12. It says here, and the younger son of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And so, what did the father do? He divided to them his livelihood. Here, the father bore the shame of his son's utter rebellion against him. Now, think about it for a moment. With the context and how they would have viewed this in the first century, the father bearing this shame and simply doing what this rebellious, self-indulgent young man wanted would have been a shameful act in and of itself. The father would have been shamed further by just bearing that at the hands of his son. People in the village would have been talking. Uh, They would have viewed the father's response as weak, as disgraceful in and of itself. Here, everything that the family over generations would have accumulated a third of it is about to be tossed down the drain. A third of it is about to be completely wasted. This inheritance, this son, this rebel in the household just wanted to vaporize with life. It reminds me a little of of Lazarus and the rich man, right? While you were alive, the rich man fared sumptuously. He had everything he wanted. And Lazarus was begging at his gate, dogs licking his sores. This was, on the part of this son, incredible rebellion, rebellion, hateful, despising the father, despising his inheritance, despising the family, despising everything but his own self. Uh, It's interesting here that the the word used for inheritance, give me the goods, the portion of the goods that falls to me, is a word in in Greek, um, bios. It means life. Give me my life or the life that is apportioned to me now so that I might waste it. The son is saying, I want my life. And so how does the father respond? Take it. It's yours. You can have it. I'll give it to you. And he divided to them his livelihood. He gave them, he gave him his life. The Lord places this choice between you and I too, doesn't he? The Lord places this choice before you. There is God's sovereignty, but there is man's responsibility. And he says to you, here's your life. What will you do with it? What are you going to do? 
Or are you going to squander it on prodigal living, wasteful, self-indulgent, selfish living? Or are you going to run off into a far country and rebel before every person this choice is laid at your feet? The difference here between this son and you and I is that that choice has been laid before you. Your default position is the far country in Adam. You can say with David that in sin, my mother conceived me. That from your first breath, you were born in sin. And it's based on your rebellion in Adam. It's your default position. You're born into the far country. You've already rebelled. You've already sinned. You've already squandered what the Lord would give you in blessing. You've already squandered it. You've already lived in prodigal living. You've already lived in debauchery. You've already run headlong away from the Father saying, I will not have this man to rule over me. You've already run away from accountability. You're already there. But God says to you, the fact that you're in that position, the fact that you've done that, the fact that you have yourself in your sin committed grave rebellion against God, God turns to you and he says, I made you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you in your mother's womb. I breathed life into you. You're my own special creation, and you are blessed. I'll be your God, and you will be my own. He says, I'm good. I'm gracious. I'm supremely loving. Perfect in all my ways. Holy, full of light, full of grace, abounding in mercy. And I'll dwell with you forever. I love you, care for you, provide for you perfectly for all eternity. You'll never hunger. You'll never thirst. You'll never want for anything but to please me. The Lord is good. Amen? That's the Lord's desire. That was the Lord's purpose. Just created you so that with all that the Lord has given you, with all of the Lord that has supplied you, with the breath that He breathed into you, that you would simply praise Him and glorify Him and worship Him. And you answer God. You say, give me my life. Give me my life. I want my own life. I'll not have your yoke upon me. You choose to live for yourself and you are dead in that sin and you won't ever make any other choice. You have the nature. We have the nature outside of Christ. We have the nature of the rebellious younger son or the rebellious older son. We have that nature, and with that nature, we turn to the Father and say, I hate you. Give me what I want. And we live for ourselves We say to the Father, I wish you were dead, right? Now put this attitude of rebelliousness, put this life, put that rebellion in light of the cross and what Christ sacrificed to redeem sinful men, to redeem sinners. You see then that everyone, everyone who lives life for themselves is a hater of God. Maybe you've witnessed and you've talked to folks before and they say, I don't hate God. I love God. But they're living for themselves. They want their life. They want their inheritance. They want that for themselves now. And even in that action saying, even in their indifference, even in their apathy, they're haters of God, despisers of good. If you're outside of Christ, you've not turned from your sin and you're not living wholeheartedly for him, you're not clinging to the Father, not in the far country, but you're at home. You're in the house of God. You're clinging to the Father for your life. If you're outside of God's saving grace in Christ, you are a hard-hearted rebel. You're a hater of God, a despiser of God, a despiser of that which is good. And here we see that profile or that portrait of this rebel in the younger son But point two here is we looked at the profile. Now let's look at the practice. That spills over into practice, how you live your life. 
And we see that beginning in verse 13. In verse 13, Christ says, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Now, not many days after means he wasn't sticking around, right? Out of this nature, out of this desire to rebel, out of this desire to live life for himself, he wasn't sticking around. He headed off as fast as he could. This now becomes, out of his nature, the bitter fruit of his rebellion. Bitter water springs up immediately. Not many days after, he headed out. And he says that here that he gathered everything that he had together, and then began his journey. That word for gather together, sunago, it means that he, he gathered all his possessions with him, and then, it, you know, this took a couple of days, so this would have obviously meant gathering everything together and then liquidating what he had to get the cash, right? If you imagine this estate, this would have taken a few days to do this. Now, here's where the few days comes in. He would have been out right away if he could, but this would have taken a few days to get this stuff together and find a buyer. The buyer in buying this estate or his portion of the estate would have had to wait around for the father to die so that he could take possession of the estate. So the son would have sold this at a discount, right? Somebody would have paid less for it because they would have to wait around. And so the son, in, in despising his inheritance even more, uh, would have taken a discounted rate to get this deal made. He would have sold this for cash, Whoever bought it got a great deal. And then it says he journeyed into a far country. He wasn't headed into town. He wasn't going to go to the local bar, the local saloon, the local video store. He wanted to get away where there would be no one there that knew him. Um, he wanted to get as far away from any accountability as possible, as far away from the father as he could. Um, he was trying to quiet, maybe, a guilty conscience. He wanted to be able to sin it up for the sake of pleasure as much as he wanted to with nobody interfering. And so he got as far away from all of this as he could get. He wanted to sin unrestrained. He wanted to sin unhindered. And this far country would have meant that he would have gone into a Gentile land, lived in a Gentile land, and squandered his inheritance, even more of a disgrace, even more shameful to his father, a disgrace to his generations, his, the, the, his family, done this in a far, far away country. And haven't you seen sinners do this? They get to a point where they're just tired. So you know what? I don't want to live for Christ. I want to live for myself. And so they just seek to escape. They want out from under what they perceive as a yoke, as a bondage, as a hardship. They just want to be able to sin it up as they want to. They won't listen to reason. They're in major escape mode. This was the younger son. He just wanted to run away from anything to do with his father, anything to do with responsibility, anything to do with accountability, and they just run and run and run, right? It's interesting here that he wanted away from peering eyes, wanted away from accountability, wanted away from the father, but we know that God is omnipresent, <laughs> You can run, but you can't hide. There's no place that you can get away from the eyes of God. Your sin is ever before his face, constantly in his face. He wanted no accountability. There is accountability coming. David wanted to escape his sin before God and cried out, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. David looking at the grace and mercy of God. God, I'm a sinful man. Hide your face from my sin. Blot out my iniquities. He wanted to be pure, wanted to be holy before God. Peter cried out, depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. I didn't want his sin. Here, the son, the younger son, the rebel, doesn't want God, doesn't want the father. He wants his sin. He wants to run away from God. If you're in Christ, you want free from your sin more than anything because God is holy you can't run far enough away to get away from God. By the way, thinking about it here as we're at this point in verse 13, where is the older son in all of this? Where's the older son? The older son is probably standing off to the side with a I knew it all along stupid smirk on his face, right? Reveling in the younger son's ignorance, reveling in the fact that um, now he can say to the father, see, I told you all along, I'm the good one. <laughs> I would never do that. And while his, in his heart, he was wishing that his father was dead too, just like the younger son was. Um, 
we'll see, get to him in a moment. All right, so he gets to the far country. What does he do there? This is the practice of the rebel. Look at verse 13. It says, and there in the far country, he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Basically, he lived it up. Lived it up and lost everything that he had. Sin is only pleasurable for a season. It's like the rich man again in Lazarus. The rich man fared sumptuously, had all his goods in this life, while the beggar, Lazarus, had nothing. Uh, Here, there is, however, in this living, there's uh, an ever-encroaching date with destiny. It is appointed for men to die once, and then comes the judgment. Here, when it says he wasted his possessions, it literally means scattered scattered his wealth on wasteful living. He just spread it all over the place. Drinking, we know from verse 30, this included prostitutes. Uh, There was a reckless, wicked, depraved, and debauched lifestyle. As Peter would say, he is running in debauchery. And he spent it all, wasted it all on this life. He's now bankrupt. He's got nothing left, and he's fallen on hard times. Now, Some might look at this example and say to themselves, boy, praise God, I was never like this man. I've just never been that bad. I grew up in church. I did all the right things. I said all the right things. I acted as I should. I never disobeyed my parents that willingly or that far. I've never sinned like that. Besides, I've been a Christian since age two. I grew up in church. Now, you may say that, but don't forget, there's a self-righteous older brother at home right? The self-righteous older brother is standing back at home, and just like you, just like you, he doesn't see his sin. He doesn't see himself as bad. Just like you, he sounds like the Pharisee with the tax collector in the temple, right? Just like you. Others may say to themselves, I wish my testimony was more like this, so that my conversion would be more obvious, so that I could see more that the Lord has saved me. What are you talking about? You would say that you want that sin, that you would rather have sinned it up? The reality is, is that you are just like this. You are just like the younger son who went off into the far country and squandered his inheritance on prodigal living, on harlots, on drinking, on wasteful living. You are just like that. There's no difference there. You need a holy perspective of your wickedness. You need a more scriptural perspective of your sin. You need to put on your scripture spectacles so that you can see more clearly. (laughs) Get yourself in the Bible. You are bankrupt too, just like this younger son. You're bankrupt. You've spent it all. And you must see your bankruptcy in order to be saved. The Bible says in Matthew 5, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You've got to see your bankruptcy. You've got to see your spiritual depravity in order for you to be saved. If you believe yourself in any way to be righteous, you are like the older brother, just as lost. All right, so back to our squanderer now. We see his practice in verse 12. We see his practice in verse 13. And now let's see the product here of the rebel. What does this rebellious lifestyle produce? What does it end up like? In verse 14, Christ says this, But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. So where did this prodigal living get this guy? What was the product of this? What did it produce? Once he had spent all, we see in verse 14, in addition to being bankrupt because of his actions, now circumstances prevailed on him also. And there were dreaded circumstances here. It says, there arose a severe famine in that land. Now, to add insult to injury, uh, this severe famine came up. Famine, anyone listening to this parable would have understood famine to be a judgment from God. And we see famine as a judgment of God throughout Scripture. And in biblical times, these famines were dreaded and rightfully so. They were serious business. Uh, Famines in Scripture so bad that the children of Israel began to eat one another, eat their children. They had nothing to eat, and they were a judgment. Uh, Here in the great wisdom and grace of God, though, uh, famines were also a grace. And even in this, we'll see 
this him coming to the end of his rope here is a grace of God. Here for the first time, in verse 14, for the first time, this prodigal son who had wasted his inheritance, rebelled against God, was beginning to be in want, was beginning to see his need, was beginning to see accurately his position. And this want, this need, this bankruptcy before God, in this he was going to see more clearly his state. We need to see our condition more clearly We need to see our state apart from Christ, outside of Christ, more clearly. And at this point, with this famine that comes up, this judgment of God, this gives us an insight into what our condition is. Outside of Christ, you're like the younger son or you're like the older son, period, end of story. The judgment of God here is to give us an insight of our condition. We are like this too. These rebels whom the Lord came to save rebelled against his grace, rebelled against his goodness, and this is our condition too. And let's get an example of that. Look back at 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. And again, this is a picture, a picture of our wretched state apart from Christ. This, I understand in Scripture, is no exaggeration. This is reality. It is the reality of our state. It's the reality of where we're at. In 2 Kings chapter 6, look at the condition they were in, beginning in verse 24. 24. Outside of Christ, this is, this is where it's at. If you think hell is going to be better than this, you're mistaken. Uh, this is where we're at outside of Christ. Look at verse 24. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 24. And it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and indeed they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. That's a lot of money for nothing, right? A lot of money for nothing. Verse 26 Then as the king of Israel was passing by the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, Help my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? He knew the only deliverance that they would have was from God. From the threshing floor or from the wine press? In other words, not from either place. There's no food. No food in the threshing floor, no grain there, and no grapes in the wine press. It's just they're in a great famine. Verse 28, And the king said to her, What is troubling you? And she answered, and just the shock of this, right? The shock of this. This woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. And so we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may eat him, but she has hidden her son. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes and he passed by on the wall. The people looked and there were underneath, he had sackcloth on his body. And he said, God, do so to me and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. Uh, principle here, the point is that this is the consequence of sin. This is the consequence of sin. The judgment that came on Israel as a consequence for their sin was designed to warn them to turn from their sin and turn back to the Lord. This isn't final judgment here. This is the grace of God. This is the grace of God in sending a famine so severe that children of Israel were eating their kids, eating their sons and daughters. Look at verse 32. But Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. And the king sent a man ahead of him. But before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, Do you see how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door, hold him fast at the door, is not the sound of his master's feet behind him. While he was still talking with him, there was a messenger coming down to him. Then the king said, surely this calamity, this calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? And Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a sea of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Near the Lord prophesies his deliverance. This hardship, both hardship and the deliverance, come from the gracious hand of God. The hardship is the forbearance, right, Romans 2, the forbearance of God that should lead to repentance. That hardship is the grace of God to turn you to Christ. When you get to the end of your rope, 
when you get to a point of spiritual bankruptcy, when you feel as though you can't go another step, that's the grace of God to you. What are you still doing in your sin? What are you still doing in the far country? Turn to God and live. When the Lord gives you difficulty and hardship, turn to Christ. There is a judgment coming that you don't want to and won't be able to bear, and you'll bear it for all eternity. This judgment, these difficulties, these trials should lead you to rescue, lead you to Christ, point you to God. Here, this prodigal son began to be in want. And look at what he did. Being in want, it says in verse 15, he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. He joined himself. That word joined there just means welded himself, connected himself. This wasn't a job. He went to this guy, just hung out around him trying to get food. Basically, he was a beggar. He was begging this man for help. And so the man, probably frustrated, didn't want to have anything to do with him, sent him into his field to feed the swine and still didn't give him any food, right? He had to eat of the pods that he, feed, that he fed the swine. Can it get, for a Jew, can it get any more degrading, any more disgraceful or shameful than this? Link yourself to a Gentile and go out and herd swine, right? This was disgraceful. Uh, your sin, his sin, my sin, our sin, apart from Christ, has placed us in this condition. Do you see that? If you're not saved here tonight, if you've not repented of your sin and put your faith and trust in Christ, this is you. You're in complete disgrace. You are in a shameful, rebellious condition. Do you see it? He saw it because he became to be in want. He began to be in want. He started coming to grips with his condition, started seeing himself for the condition that he was in, saw himself as a beggar, saw himself as hooked to a Gentile feeding pigs, right? Saw himself for the rebel that he was. And then it says here, he sent him into his fields to feed swine, and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Even his begging came to nothing. His begging came to nothing. These pods were nothing, probably not fit for a human to eat. In the midst of this famine, it was probably barely enough just to keep the pig alive, much less him. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with those pods. You see the destitute condition that this guy is in. He latched onto this guy for scraps. He didn't have anything. He had nothing. He had no one. The pods weren't any food at all. Couldn't eat the pigs. <laughs> God here. The son in this far country, in this condition, would have seen and does see. He comes to his senses and realizes that the father is all he's got. It's the only hope that he has. Now imagine for a moment. Think about what he just did to his father. What he just said. How he just behaved. What all of his actions meant. It was supremely wicked, supremely disgraceful, hateful, unloving, despising his father, hating his father. And now his father is the only hope he's got. God is our only hope. You're in this condition if you're outside of Christ, and God is your only hope. There is salvation in no other. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It is Christ, Christ alone. Here, this rebel son, remember, hated his father, rebelled against him, dishonored him, disrespected him, was unloving, unforgiving, ungrateful, wished he were dead, hated his loving accountability, and he hated his own responsibility. He takes the blessings of the father, and he completely and totally squanders them on his own lusts. He completely and totally put the father out of his mind, right? Put the father completely out of his mind and lived totally for himself. Wanted only for himself. Was completely selfish, completely self-absorbed, completely self-indulgent. Feeds his flesh on nothing. And as a result, where did that get him? Great want. Spiritual bankruptcy. Destitute put him at the end of his rope, he was at rock bottom with no one to help, no one to come to his rescue, nowhere to turn, facing certain death. 
facing death. And if it weren't for one, right? If it weren't for one, there is one who will help. There is one place to go. And listen, it's not a plan B. It's not a second best. It is absolutely and completely what we do not deserve for the way that we've mistreated him, for the way that we've rebelled against him, for the way that we've hated him and despised him and despised him simply by living for ourselves, living according to our own lusts. We've cast off what we see as a yoke of bondage, which is, yoke is easy. His yoke is light. His yoke is good. It's not a burden. It is the best of any option imaginable. But because of this son's utter wickedness, complete and total depravity, it might have been the last place he thought of because it requires humility. It requires the setting down of your wicked, deplorable pride your wicked self-righteousness, you can't make any excuses. The son going back home, going back to his father, what excuse is there for what he's done? What excuse is there for how he spoke to him? What excuse is there for how he spent his family's estate? What excuse is there for, and this is wicked, right? There are no excuses. Uh, you can't go back with any self-righteousness. You can't go back there thinking that somehow, you know, he owes me. <laughs> what? He doesn't owe you anything. Look at what you've done. Look at how you've lived. Look at how you are. Look at who you are. He doesn't owe you anything. There's no self-righteousness here. There's no pride. There are no excuses. Look what happens in verse 17. The son, realizing there's only one option, boy, it is a glorious option. The son doesn't quite know it yet, but it's a blessed option. It's the only option, and it is beautiful. It's perfect, right? Verse 17. But when he came to himself, the son said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? You know, for a hired day laborer at this point in time in the first century, they were just one step above a slave. They just got labor, got work for the day. It was enough work for that day, and oftentimes the man that hired them simply gave them enough to eat. Gave him enough to put food on the table for the family, and that was it. So it would have just been enough bread for that day. But here, the graciousness, right, of the Father in giving more bread enough to spare. Just the graciousness of the Father. And he knows that. The Son knows it. When he reflects on the Father, and reflects on how his Father was, and what his life was like before he left and squandered his inheritance, he knows the Father. He knows the father is a good man, a gracious man. He knows how the father treated him when he was a son in his house. And he remembers what his father was like. How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? Here's what I'll do. I'll arise. I'll go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me like one of your hired servants. The son comes to his senses. Coming to his senses, he realizes his sin. He knows his condition. He knows what he's done. He knows how his father is. I've said it before. I've said it many times that when you're in sin, you're insane. Uh, this son, there's no question about it, he was insane to do what he did, right? Insane to continue living in the far country the way he was. When he comes to his senses, he realizes what he's done. He realizes what his father is like. He knows his father. And he does what's right. He does only what he can at this point. There is no other option. And he reflects on the goodness of the father. How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to eat? Think about it. Even thinking of doing this was incredibly bold, right? This was audacious. This would have been viewed by many as a shameful act in and of itself because of what the son had been guilty of. You're going to do what? You're going to go where? After everything that you've done? Uh, this was very audacious, but there's no other choice. There's no other choice, and he knew it. He hoped that his father would make him a hired servant. Maybe 
and maybe not, but possibly in the back of his mind he's thinking, maybe he'll take me back as a day laborer. Take me back as a day laborer. I'll, you know, have to eat crow, maybe crawl through some broken glass, but maybe over time, the graciousness of my father, I'll work myself back into the house, right? Maybe over time, I can make restitution. I can make right. I can once again be in my father's good graces. I'll just have to work it off for a while, spend some time uh, working in the fields, being a hired hand. But that's not what happens here, is it? There's no working your way back to restitution. There's no working your way back into God's good graces. There's no working to earn favor. There's no meritorious work that you can do at all. This is pure grace alone. And we see this in the response of the Father. There's no prayer that the prodigal son can say in the far country that will put him back into right favor with God, that will reconcile him to his Father. He can't sit in the far country and ask Jesus into his heart. You know, he can't sit in the far country and pray to receive Christ. He can't sit in the far country and just be baptized out there. Maybe he plants the First Baptist Church of the far country. It's not going to work. He can't do it. You cannot stay in the far country and be saved. He comes to his senses. He's got to leave. There's only one place he can go, and that's the only place he can go, and he goes there. He has to leave. This is a picture here of repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. Repentance in seeing your condition where you are in the far country, turning around from that, leaving the far country, leaving that wasteful living, and returning to the Father. It's a picture of re repentance. Many think in reading through this parable that both sons were saved. Here's a saved younger son who just slips into sin, goes off into sin for a while, and comes back. Now, both sons here are lost. Now, we'll see that in the parable. Both sons are lost you can't be a Christian and hang out wasteful living in the far country. It's he that endures to the end will be saved. This is a picture of genuine repentance and genuine faith. Repentance and faith here, if you look at this, are not meritorious, are they? Because the son turns and repents doesn't mean that he deserves salvation, right? Or merits salvation. What does he deserve? He deserves what he got. He deserves judgment. He deserves shame. He deserves disgrace. He deserves hell. But he gets what he deserves. This is not meritorious, this turning. This faith here isn't meritorious. He thinks on the Father. He knows the Father. He knows that he's a gracious man. And he trusts. <laughs> he trusts that if he goes back to his Father, that his Father would be gracious enough even to make him a hired servant. Just to make him a hired servant. He trusts. He has faith in the Father. that The Father will spare him. There's no merit here. There's no boasting here. Does the son have anything to boast in? Nothing at all except for the grace of the father. There's nothing to boast in here except that he knows that his father is a good man. There's nothing to boast in here. There's nothing to merit. And we know from Scripture that the grace, that the repentance, and the faith are all gifts from God. We know if you compare the parable of the lost son with the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin, that at the same time it is the son's responsibility to turn from his sin in the far country and head back to the father, trusting in the father. We also know from those other two parables that it's the father that pursues the sheep into the far country and drags his sheep back. It pursues and turns over the house to find the lost coin and rejoices over finding that which was lost. This is the equal truths of God's sovereignty and salvation and man's responsibility. There's no boasting here except in the grace of the Father, the goodness of the Father. Again, it's his only option. Identify yourself. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, if you can somehow make your way through a day in your life believing that you're okay, you're the older son and you're lost if you are coming to the end of yourself, bankrupt over your sin, the end of your rope, then maybe that's the Lord opening your eyes to your genuine, true condition apart from Christ. And that is the mercy and grace of Christ. Do the only thing that you can do. Turn to Christ and live. Put your faith and trust Christ. God wants to save you. Why will you die? And I'm telling you, it can happen right now. 
It can happen this very minute. It can happen tonight. You can come to your senses, forsake your sin, turn to Christ in faith and be saved. Why would you persist in the far country hanging out with the pigs, eating the slop? Just turn. Turn to Christ and live. Turn back to the Father. You realize it's nothing that you deserve and it's nothing that you, can do, that you can do and realize that you deserve judgment for all that you've done against God. But turn to Christ and live. If you're a Christian tonight, <laughs> rejoice. The Lord has, even in the state that you're in, wicked, depraved in your sin, that, that the Lord would be gracious and not only take you back as a hired servant. He didn't do that. He put a robe on you put a ring on you, put sandals on your feet, killed the fatted calf, and there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repented. Amen? And we have a gracious Heavenly Father. Turn to Christ and be saved. I don't understand uh, why anyone who questions that or has difficulty with that or if you're here, then Lord have mercy. I would pray that you're here because you want to seek God. You want to seek salvation. You want to seek Christ. If you're not saved, see yourself in the far country and be saved. Return to Christ. Turn from your sin and put your faith in Him. Just don't persist there. What are you waiting for? Uh, there is bread to spare in the kingdom. If you eat of that bread, you'll never hunger again. You drink of that water, you'll never thirst again. Just turn to Christ and be saved. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, God, thank you for this, this glorious picture in Luke 15 of how gracious, merciful, and good you are, how destitute, bankrupt, and undeserving we are. Lord, how merciful and gracious, God, you are to save us, Lord, to welcome us back, to embrace us as sons, the lavish blessings on us as sons. God, praise be to your name. Thank you, Lord, for salvation. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for his substitution on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for the glories of Calvary. Lord, thank you for your pardon, your forgiveness. We were wicked rebels, just wicked rebels, despising you, haters of good, living life for ourselves. Yet you, Lord, in your great mercy, save us, Wash us clean and rejoice and repent, uh, rejoice over our repentance. Thank you, Lord, for this picture. And thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness and your pardon. Thank you for Christ. All these we, things we pray in his name. Amen.